For more, let's bring in our poly panel this morning. We're joined by Liberal MP Dave Sharma and Labor MP Josh Wilson. Good morning to both of you. Thanks for joining us this morning. We'll actually get to the, the what's happened with the Nationals and the Coalition this week a little bit later, but I want to start with the COVID situation with people in Sydney this morning waking up, uh, many people waking up to a lockdown situation in that city. Josh, the approach taken in New South Wales is certainly very different to the state that you're in, in WA, when we've seen outbreaks there. We've seen a strict lockdown uh, that's been much broader than what we're seeing in Sydney this morning. Do you think the approach in New South Wales is appropriate? Well, good morning, Joan Fowzier. Look, I'm not going to get into the game of comparing and contrasting with the aim of being critical. I wish the people of New South Wales and the people of Sydney all the best. Uh, here in Western Australia, we have managed outbreaks very well. We've taken a sort of short, sharp approach to lockdowns and then got back to life uh, uh, as normal pretty quickly. Um, New South Wales have, have taken a bit of a different approach. I hope that what they're doing works as best as uh, it possibly can in the present circumstances. Clearly, they're, they're now going to try the lockdown method in, in certain LGAs, and let's hope that gets the infection under control. I mean, unfortunately, we're in a situation where the vaccine rollout hasn't progressed very far, and that makes all jurisdictions in Australia vulnerable to these kinds of circumstances on a rolling basis. And, and uh, I, I obviously encourage the, the federal government to get on with its responsibility in, in that space. There's a very interesting uh, op-ed in The Guardian today. It's written by Bill Botel, the adjunct professor of uh, UNSW, and, and he outlines how the rest of the world uh, got on with uh, responding to the Delta variant. Um, he talked about how the rest of the world capitalised on rapid population vaccination. And now I'm going to quote his article where he says, but not Australia. Month by month, the federal government squandered the precious advantage of time conferred by zero COVID. No rush became the order of the day. Australia now does seem to be playing catch up with these new quarantine facilities, the delays in the vaccination programs. Um, Dave Sharma, has Australia squandered its COVID advantage? I'm sorry, I, I didn't. I didn't catch oh, that question. That, okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, I, I missed that question. Well, let me tell you, it was a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> I only called the start of it, something about Bill Botel in the, in the Guardian. Okay, no, I just, um, Dave Sharma. It was just a question that has Australia squandered the advantage that it had due to the closed borders, um, what it had from from being able to basically lay down the foundation before the next pandemic or the next, next uh, outbreak. Have we squandered that time? No, I don't think so at all. I mean, uh, first and foremost, obviously, we've had far fewer deaths here in Australia, which is the ultimate measure of success from this disease. We've had um, one death from COVID this year. That was someone who, who brought it in from overseas and unfortunately passed away. We don't have anyone in the ICU at the moment. Uh, and I think ultimately that's the, you know, the test of how well you can come through this disease. The question now about opening up, um, vaccines will help. But if you look overseas, I mean, Singapore has a very high vaccination rate. They've been in a prolonged lockdown now for five weeks. Uh, in the United Kingdom, there are still significant social distancing restrictions. I think we need to bear in mind that um, higher levels of vaccine coverage will help, uh, but they're not going to be a cure-all or a panacea. We're still going to need to have, um, you know, high testing rates, uh, sophisticated contact tracing regimes. And we're still going to need to have... Uh, restrictions if there are new outbreaks and new variants that emerge. Yeah, the Prime Minister made this that is going point. To this... be... Sorry, Dave Sharma, new... we seem to be having a couple of issues with your for... link, but we will continue on it. And I wanted to pick you up on, on that, that the Prime Minister made that point this week about um, other countries with high vaccination rates and that not necessarily meaning that they had fewer cases and fewer deaths in their country. So what does that mean for Australia when our vaccination rates do get up to a better level? What is the government thinking about the next step beyond that? Are we going to keep seeing these lockdowns and keep seeing closed borders? What's the government's picture? 
Look, I, to be honest, um, I think I'd, I'd need a crystal ball to be able to give you a good answer on that. It will be informed by the overseas experience, but it'll also be infer- informed by whether there are new variants that emerge. I mean, the ideal scenario, obviously, is there's a level of risk of allows to ease up on the border restrictions and ease up on the movement restrictions. But um, we can see from the experience overseas, we seem to be having some problems with that Dave Sharma's communication his link there um, this is the time isn't it when we talk about zoom and FaceTime and and whatnot we we depend on uh, good technology but sometimes they fail us um, Josh Wilson I want to bring you into this conversation um, about you know, let's let's talk about the return of Barnaby Joyce to Parliament. Let's talk about the return of Barnaby Joyce um, to the uh, coalition. He now heads the National Party. Uh, he is now the Deputy Prime Minister. There's a lot of disunity within the coalition, a lot of disunity uh, within the Nats, the Liberals as well. Is this an advantage for Labour? Well, it's not about whether it's an advantage for Labour. It's a disadvantage for the nation. That's the, that's the bottom line. I mean, unfortunately, it's it's chaos and disunity when we need responsible government focused on on the problems we face and they're the ones that you've you've just outlined i mean we had uh, a lot longer than other countries in much less pressured circumstances to get ourselves ready in relation to the vaccine and yet it's been a rolling it's a rolling mess and we see uh, new areas of incompetence being excused by previous areas of incompetence, almost like a, a sort of a babushka doll mm. of failures. We, you know, we did learn this week just on the, on the, on the vaccine program that we couldn't have a national uh, information campaign because that would have prompted too many people to come forward when the vaccine supply wasn't there to meet that demand. So I think having Barnaby Joyce come back, the chaos, the clowns are in charge, the circus returns at a time when we actually need to be dealing with some areas that have uh, gone long neglected mm. vaccine rollout aged care climate and energy the list goes on we hopefully have a better link to dave sharma here dave sharma we're talking about barnaby joyce and the nationals this week and uh, him becoming the leader of the nationals again and therefore the deputy prime minister and with the arrival of barnaby joyce as leader the nationals are clearly throwing their weight around on their agenda um, particularly on whether there's a target set to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 but also we saw them essentially attempt to rewrite the murray darling basin plan is this a sign of things to come in the lead up to the next election of what we're going to see with the nationals and within the coalition? Well, look, I'd, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think part of the reason that, you know, Barnaby was returned to the nationals' leadership is, is those that supported him in the party room uh, want to see him be a stronger voice for regional Australia. Um, and probably, inevitably, that involves a bit more um, brand differentiation. But I ultimately don't think it's going to change the direction of policy a whole lot. I mean, uh, you know, a, a lot of the decisions we've taken as a government have obviously involved the nationals and the national party members within cabinet. Um, and obviously anything that goes to our combined party room, well, everyone has an, has an equal say in that in the, in the policy making. So I'd expect under the nationals, under a new leadership, to focus a bit more um, directly on the concerns and priorities of regional Australia. And that's a good thing. That's who they're there to represent. That's their, by and large, their constituency. Um, but Liberal members of parliament, such as myself, that represent quite different electorates, will certainly continue to focus on their priorities and concerns as well and speak out loudly on behalf of those. And look, that's how the coalition works well. We all bring a different perspective to bear. We all bring the perspectives of our own communities. And together, we you know, formulate a policy that is in the best interests of all of Australia. Well, it seems that the National Party has certainly been reinvigorated to really join in the conversation about climate change and the targets um, that Australia should be reaching as well. Um, but what seems to be missing in, in the conversation here in Australia is this, this transition, the jobs transition. And that's what a lot of people in the regions, uh, particularly the coal electorates, are very concerned about. Um, Josh Wilson, you're the Shadow Assistant Manager for the Environment. Our Australia Talk survey that the ABC conducted showed that climate change policies should not be at the expense of jobs. Why isn't Labor focusing on the plan or strategies for transmission jobs in the regions? 
Well, we absolutely are focused on that. We've never bought into that false choice that somehow having an, a sensible national energy policy and acting on climate change does anything other than secure our economic future and actually secure jobs in this country going to the future. What puts those jobs and our economic and social well-being at risk is a continuation of uh, the irresponsibility, the complete inaction that we've seen through eight years and three terms of a coalition government that cannot bring itself to even settle a national energy policy. I mean, there's just no doubt. And rural and regional Australia actually chief among the parts of, of our country that will be affected by climate change and by the energy trans transition that's already occurring. And they're being let down by a government that isn't taking action. And in fact, what, what is sad, I think, is that the contest we're now seeing, the reinvigorated contest with a, a Barnaby Joyce-led nationals, is, is not about action, it's about language. And that's mm. every feature of this government, I think, in some ways. It's about whether or not the modern Liberals can succeed in uh, confecting a, a formula that's we, that we will preferably, possibly, virtually, maybe get to net zero by 2050, and, and the wacky nationals will have none of that. But, but what people have to hold on to is underneath that is the actual policy. And the only actual policy of the present government is to get to net zero in the second half of this century. So by <clears throat> 2099, that's the only policy. While all around us, G7 nations, uh, developed nations around the country, businesses, the National Farmers Federation, the BCA, everybody else is crystal clear on getting net zero to 2050. Uh, the nationals and the modern liberals are tussling over what is essentially a tricky political formula. Dave Sharma, we, all, we do want to give you a quick reply to that, but also finishing off with an, another topic as well. And you've been chairing a committee that's been scrutinising Australia's political and diplomatic response to Myanmar's military coup in February. Ha, first of all, a response to what Josh Wilson was saying, but also has Australia's response there in Myanmar been adequate in your view? Sure. Well, I'll respond briefly to Josh. I, I just say, look, we're getting on with the job. I mean, just this last week in Parliament, we put forward um, what's called a regulation that would allow the Australian Renewable Energy Agency to invest in things like soil carbon, in clean hydrogen, in low emission steel and aluminium, uh, and in electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And Labor voted to oppose that, uh, to new money, to go into new projects that will create new jobs and help transition to a lower emissions economy. So I don't buy the argument that we're the ones conflicted over this. They're the ones that are having an internal tussle and can't agree on a target for 2030. Uh, they can talk aspirationally about what they might want to achieve in 2050, but they can't settle on a target, which is the actual target we have to have under our Paris Agreement for 2030. Um, on Myanmar, thank you for raising that, because I think this is a really important issue to... Um, the civil war that's underway in Myanmar is threatening to engulf the whole country. We could be looking at the prospect of a, um, a failed state right in the heart of the, uh, the Indo-Pacific. The military coup and takeover there um, has not been a success on its own terms. It's failed to unite the country. The economy uh, is contracting in free fall. There's still civil disobedience and resistance, which is leading to armed resistance and armed insurgency. So I think um, the whole region needs to um, look at this a bit more closely, and particularly the neighbouring countries and the ASEAN states, so this, 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 the Southeast Asian state, but the near Myanmar, um, need to be a little more forward-leaning and forceful in convincing the generals who now run Myanmar why it's in the best interests of themselves, but also their country, to hand back to civilian rule as quickly as possible. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Dave Sharma and Josh Wilson, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks for coming in this morning. Thanks so much.